Well, think about the amazing things we've learned this past week. Since we last gathered together, we have, we have learned some things that we, had, we would have never known had it not been for the COVID-19 outbreak. For example, evidently toilet paper, not gold, not silver, not diamonds, not oil, or any other precious substance, but toilet paper is the most desired commodity in the United States when we're facing a pandemic. Who would have thought, right? I mean, you'd think there'd be a run on the banks, not a run on Charmin, but whatever, it is what it is. By the way, at this church, we do have plenty of toilet paper here, but I am warning you, if you steal what we have, we will pray that God gives you intestinal distress for a month. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. We will not actually pray that. Some might, but we won't. Um, we've learned that people, people hoard odd things now, right? I mean, some of the things that you see out there are nonsensical. I, had a, I saw a post from a friend of mine who posted someone's shopping cart with about two dozen bottles of Italian dressing and several bags of Doritos. I don't know what you're going to do with two dozen bottles of Italian dressing, but whatever, I don't know. Uh, memes are funny all the time, but man, some of the memes that are going out right now are, are just way too good. So take, for example, this one, the first one. Um, I saw this on Facebook, Mark's safe from coronavirus. You see a fortress of toilet paper with a couple eyes in the middle of it. I saw this one. I thought this one was really good. Um, next one. Whoever started this game at the beginning of 2020, please finish it quickly. <laughs> I like that one. And then we were just talking about this one today. This guy, trust Jesus as much as people are trusting hand sanitizer. Um, ooh. That one is funny and stinging all at the same time, isn't it? Listen, we've learned some lessons, but let me give you something this morning that we need to discipline ourselves to remember when we're in the middle of this mess. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. What? How, how in the world can you say that? Have you seen the stock market? Have you been to the grocery stores and have you seen the empty shelves and the, the masses of humanity buying up all, everything that they, th they can buy? Have you heard of all of the events being canceled, the difficulty that those cancellations are causing to so many people? Don't you know that the people all around us are frightened, they're anxious, they're uncertain about the future? Yes, I am aware of all of those things. But none of those circumstances changes the fundamental truth that the Lord is good. This morning we're going to step away from our study in the, in the book of Habakkuk. Largely because I was going to start teaching through chapter 2, which contains a section of several woes that God uh, pronounces against Babylon. He pronounces woe against Babylon for things like arrogance and greed and hoarding and violence and idolatry. Application would have been really easy this week, you know what I'm saying? But we're going to get back to Habakkuk in just a, in, in next week, actually. But today I want to just lift up our eyes from all of this mess and focus our gaze upon God. And I want to remind all of us to see the good God who delivers his people from our fears, saves us out of our trouble, and provides our needs. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is good. Sometimes it takes difficult moments to really understand truly how good he is. There's an old saying that my mom used to quote, it's always darkest just before the dawn. I think the point of that was simply this, that we need the darkness to appreciate to a greater degree the light. So here's what I'm trying to say. Many of our neighbors are panicking. Maybe you struggle with feelings of anxiousness too. I got to tell you, uh, the other day, um, Thursday night, as a matter of fact, Noah sent me a, a picture. He was at Meyer, him and his wife were at Meyer, and so he took a picture of the bread aisle. And there was absolutely no bread on any of the shelves whatsoever. And I looked at that. And it's Thursday, right? And so my wife normally goes grocery shopping on Saturday, and so I know it's Thursday. We're, our stores are getting pretty low at home. Um, and so as a, as a husband and as a father, I start thinking, oh, no, how, how do I provide for my family when everybody's buying everything and there's nothing available? And so I got to tell you, just for a moment, a, a, a brief, not panic, but a little bit of stress hit my heart. And I had to check that for a minute and say, wait a second, hold on. No, 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 God is good. And you know what? I've never seen the righteous baking bread or, 
or, or his seed forsaken. I, I've, never, I've never seen us not have what we need. There's never been a time in our lives when God has not provided everything that we need as, as a family, and so we're, we're just going to trust in him. I know what it's like, though, to, to have these tinges of stress that are put on us during these circumstances, but I also understand that, that this time and these circumstances ought to drive us to magnify the glory and worth of God in, an, in our heart and life. Why? Because while uncertainty rules this moment of time, we live in the certainty that our God is for us and that our God is good to his people. And I think one psalm that reflects this truth and reinforces this truth is the 34th psalm. I'd invite you to turn to Psalm 34 if you would, and as you're there, uh, I want to give you a, a little bit of information about this psalm. It was written by David immediately after he had gone through what had had to have felt like a, a moment of helplessness in his life. David uh, was a young man, and he was chosen by God to become the king of Israel because he was, as God said, a man after his own heart, and David was a hero. He became a hero in Israel, and he won many battles but not everybody in Israel loved David. In fact, King Saul hated David. He was jealous of David and tried to kill him. So David did the only thing he could do. He ran from this powerful king, and, but King Saul pursued him. The only place left for David to go was a place called Gath. Now, there was a problem. You see, David killed a man, a giant named Goliath, the champion of Israel's enemies, the Philistines, but Goliath was from Gath. And David went to Gath, and, and he was probably hoping that nobody there would notice him. This, this happened a few years ago, and he was probably hoping that nobody would, would recognize him or even understand or recognize the fact that he was carrying Goliath's sword, which probably wasn't the best move when you're trying to go in undercover. But he did, and, and so uh, it wasn't a great strategy because, of course, somebody recognized him. Some men recognized David. They knew that he was the king of Israel, the future king of Israel, and that he was praised among the people of Israel for killing ten thousands. And so the men of Gath took David to Achish, who is the king of Gath. And the Bible tells us that, that David took these words to heart. Why? They were afraid of him. He was their enemy, and he took what they were saying to heart and was much afraid of Achish the king of Gath. Now, let me tell you how David got out of that mess. He acted like he was nuts. He acted insane. He went to the, the doors of the, the gate of the city and he began to scribble just uh, ir illegible, um, illogical, unreasonable things on that gate. And, and then he began to drool all over himself. And so the men took uh, David to Achish the king and they, Achish looked at him and said, listen, I got enough crazy people here. I don't need another one. And he forced David out of Gath. And David then went to a cave at Adullam. And it was there that he wrote these words. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. And delivered me from all my fears. You might want to underline that word there. Those who look to him are radiant. And their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him. And saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. You know, the words of Psalm 34 tell us how David made it through this time when his heart was much afraid. They tell us how David navigated this period in his life when he was almost certain that he was going to die. And think about it. David was on the run from a king who wanted nothing more than to kill him. But he ran right into a king who had every reason and a great opportunity to kill him. No wonder David was afraid. But David learned an important lesson that he wrote down while he was hiding in the cave just after he had escaped from Achish. The lesson is simply this, the Lord is good. 
even when danger abounds and especially when we are afraid the Lord is good so Psalm 34 effectively opens a window to David's soul the text shows us what David did to keep from being paralyzed by danger and fear so today I want to show you from David's experience three steps that you can take to keep from becoming paralyzed by danger and fear you know we're at the beginning of this COVID-19 thing it really is just the beginning of it I believe and all the experts are saying you know it's probably gonna get worse before it gets better um, people are, are saying that uh, in, in Ohio itself uh, just the sheer statistics and numbers and ratios bear out that right now there are probably a hundred thousand people at least infected in the state of Ohio that's just based on sheer numbers right averages law of averages data um, and and we're going to see more reactions over the over the coming days we're gonna see more news come out and uh, and the reason I want to give this message to us including myself is that the, the last thing that the people of God need to happen is for us to become so aware of the danger that we become paralyzed by it that we become paralyzed by fear God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of sound mind we, we need to keep that in mind Okay, so COVID-19 is a, is a terrible thing, right? And it's caused suffering in the world already. We, we admit that. But, but we're in Christ. What are you going to threaten me with? Death? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Are, are you going to threaten me with suffering? But yet God uses suffering many times to draw us closer to him causes us to rely on him to a greater degree to increase our trust and faith in him to grow in our faith here's my point there is no reason to be captivated and paralyzed by fear there's none the media is going to ramp it up man the media is going to amp it up why that's what they do think about this what's the media's job the media's job is to get viewers why because in getting viewers they get advertisers and getting advertisers they get advertisers they get money Okay, so, so they're going to try to ramp this up and they're going to try to get you glued to the television 24-7 looking for all the latest things. And I think we should be aware. I think we should be alert. I believe with everything in me that, that we need to be people who know what's going on in the times in which we live. I think we need to be responsible and I, and I believe that we need to make uh, decisions responsibly. And we're trying right now to do that the best we possibly can within the life of Cross Point Church and as Cross Point Church relates to our community here in Westerville and, and in the cities beyond. And we're going to continue to try to be the best neighbors that we can possibly be. And we're going to continue to try to, to make decisions, the right decisions for, for, for each other and for those neighbors around us driven by love of God and love of our neighbor. We're, we're going to continue to do that. We need to be wise. We need to be discerning. But the one thing we don't need to be is afraid. Don't be afraid. Have faith. And, and this psalm teaches us how not to be paralyzed by danger and fear, but to have faith. So the, the first step that I want to share with you, we see in verses one, and, 1 through 3, and that is simply praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, I know the idea of praising the Lord seems pretty basic, right? But, but how many of you have actually taken time this week during this avalanche of news that was dumped on us every single day to actually stop and praise the Lord for who he is and what he has done and what he's promised to do that's that's not our fleshly reaction our fleshly reaction is to become consumed with everything that's going on around us but yet David as he was on the run in a cave by himself stopped to do what to praise the Lord and the inference here is that he didn't just praise the Lord after he had gotten to the cave and was no longer in the clutches of an enemy king, but he actually praised the Lord while he was in the clutches of the enemy king, and his future was somewhat uncertain. David wrote, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And I want you to notice just a few things about this. I want you to notice that, that David here praised the Lord personally. There was no one who could praise the Lord for him in his circumstance. 
He had to make a personal decision to have an attitude of praise toward God regardless of the trouble that he was living in and living through. Listen, no one can come alongside of you and make you praise the Lord. All I can do is con con communicate this step to you. But you have to make a decision that in the midst of everything that's going on, no matter how troubling it may become, that you are going to praise the Lord in and through this. David praised the Lord continually. His view of God was not tainted by his circumstances. He, he wasn't sitting there thinking, oh God, if you were a better God, then I would not be here. God, if you were a better God, if you were a more faithful God, I wouldn't have to be on the run uh, from King Saul. As a matter of fact, you've anointed me king over your people. And so, God, if, if you were really living up to your end of the bargain, I, I wouldn't be on the run right now. My life wouldn't be in danger. God, you're not, you're not doing what you said you would do. We don't see that here in David at all. We see the fact that this, this man, his view of God was not changed it was not tainted by his circumstances david knew that the lord is good david understood that the lord is worthy of praise david knew that he was uh, he needed to praise god even in the midst of difficulty and trial david knew that the lord is good and worthy of praise and even when he was being chased by the king my point is this, that our circumstances do not change the fact that the Lord is good, but our circumstances certainly drive us to take our eyes off the one who is good. And so instead of living a life of continual praise, we will become consumed with worry and fear. The great thing about praising God in the midst of trials is it takes our eyes off of ourselves, it takes our eyes off of our circumstances, and it puts our eyes on that one who is fixed and faithful and true. And good above all he praised the Lord continually and David praised the Lord verbally he didn't just praise God in his heart David praised God with his mouth why is this important I think it's important for, for a few reasons but number one what comes out of our mouth is actually what's in our heart the Bible says Jesus in talking he said it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person but what comes out of the mouth this defiles the person but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and th and this defiles a person for out of the heart come evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality theft false witness slander these are what defile a person but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone except the CDC tells you that right now wash your hands so wash your hands right 20 seconds, get the fingertips, it's all good, it's public service announcement, over. Um, why is it important to praise the Lord verbally during times where there is danger and uncertainty? Because praising the Lord verbally is an indicator that we're trusting Him internally. That our, that our trust in Him and our faith in Him has not lapsed or waned, but but it is, it is an outward expression of an inward trust that we have in him. I saw, there's a lot of information coming out to uh, pastors right now and church leaders. And um, everybody has something to say. Everybody has a suggestion as to what we ought to be doing and how we ought to be doing it. I, we've taken some of those suggestions clearly and we're following some of those those. Uh, some of that advice because I, I thought it was wise it was good but but one of the things that I saw uh, was stop singing songs if you if you choose together together don't sing songs uh, because when people sing things come out of their mouth and so um, it's true it's it happens to you I see it all the time and um, I'm <laughs> kidding I can't see it from here um, but people are no don't sing and I thought I'm sorry we're not gonna not sing uh, the, the scripture says that we ought to come together and we ought to, to worship the Lord with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And, and I think it's important to sing these songs because it is a confession made with our mouth of the goodness of our God in the midst of trials and circumstances. Think about the songs we sang this morning. God is for us. I will build my life upon his love. It is a sure foundation. I will trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Listen, this is, a, this is a verbal confession of our faith in God. I think it's important that we keep doing it. Because it reminds us of these truths. David 
praised with his mouth. When you praise with your mouth in times of trouble, it's an indicator that you actually trust him, that your trust rests in him. Listen, if all you can do is spout fear and worry about COVID-19, that might be an indicator that you're not trusting God in the midst of this situation. So do you want to make it through difficult times? Learn to praise the Lord personally, continually, and verbally. Now let me show you why this is really important. Because what, what I found is that by praising the Lord, your confidence grows. David said, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. David did not have confidence in his faith. He had confidence in who his faith was founded upon. Someone said this, it's not great faith in God that you need. It's faith in a great God. When you have faith in a great God, then your faith becomes great faith. I'm not against great faith, but don't put the emphasis upon your faith. Put your emphasis upon who God is. And when you make your boast in the Lord, as you boast in the Lord, as you glory in the Lord, as you bless the Lord, you're going to find that your faith grows. So when you praise, your faith is strengthened. And we are living in a day and time now that has been thrust upon us. We need to demonstrate that we, of all people, have faith in a great God. That the Lord is good. And our attitudes and our actions and our words during this time should demonstrate to all those who are looking at us that we trust a great and good God. So praise the Lord. Here's the second thing. Seek the Lord. What did David do when he was in trouble? Verse number four, I sought the Lord. Again, it sounds so very basic, doesn't it? But let me ask you, has your first instinct this week been to seek the Lord? Or was your first instinct to buy hand sanitizer? There's nothing wrong with having hand sanitizer. We also have plenty of that around the building. But that ought not be our trust. Today, many people, many churches around the country have shut down. And, and I, if those pastors believe that was the best thing, the right thing to do for their people, if, if the pastors of those churches believe that was the right thing to do, then you know what? We ought not criticize those churches that have made different decisions than we've made today. Okay? We ought not criticize them. It's not that they don't have faith, and it's not that they're not strong in their faith, or they're not serious about serving God. They've just made a different decision. Within our own church, we have many who have decided for reasons to stay home today and to watch online. And we ought not criticize them for staying home. In our message uh, to the church, we said you need to uh, determine what is the best course of action for your family. But let me say this to every believer your your confidence should not be in the fact that you have come to church today and your confidence should not be in the fact that you have stayed home from church today your confidence uh, should not be in the fact that you are self-quarantining or not self-quarantining your confidence is in the Lord and that's why we seek him we've made a lot of jokes um, about the toilet paper and hand sanitizer thing it be, it's become a huge joke there's memes about it everywhere and people are laughing about it and having a good time and and i'm thankful because it kind of keeps the spirit light right it's kind of a heavy and oppressive time right now and all this kind of just lightens the mood a little bit but i was thinking why in the world would why would people just be going towards this i don't understand it necessarily but i think if you really consider what is happening you realize that it's actually a very sad display of having nowhere else to turn and nothing else to trust in. We humans, were self-sufficient people. And, and we will often do what we can just to show that we are still somewhat in control. I can't stop the virus, but you know I can do this, or I can do that. But let me urge you brothers and sisters instead of placing your confidence in things that you can do seek the Lord 
David sought the Lord. Today our president has called for Americans to pray. This is not an endorsement of any political party or any candidate. The reality is that God, by his sovereign will and choosing, has established that we have the president that we have at this time in our nation's history. And I don't care if he is a conservative Republican. I don't care if he is a liberal Democrat. I don't care if he is a Martian. We need to recognize that God has established him as an authority over us in the nation. And we need to respect the fact that he has called on Americans to pray. I looked up his proclamation, and, and this is what, part of what he wrote in urging Americans to pray. In this time, we must not cease asking God for added wisdom, comfort, and strength. And we must especially pray for those who have suffered harm or who have lost loved ones. I ask you to join me in a day of prayer for all people who have been afflicted or affected by this coronavirus pandemic and to pray for God's healing hand to be placed on the people of our nation. Now, I don't know President Trump's spiritual condition, but even our president knows that our success as a people is tied to going to God and asking for his divine intervention. We see here in verse 4, David sought the Lord. And look, the Lord answered him and delivered him, but don't miss this, from all his fears. David didn't say he delivered me from my circumstance. David didn't say he delivered me from my situation. David said he delivered me from my fears. This leads me to believe that when David sought the Lord, while he was still very much in danger in Gath, and the Bible says, David said his, his heart was gripped with fear that he sought the Lord and the Lord delivered him from that fear. You want to be delivered from fear? You're struggling with fear right now? Seek the Lord. We know that eventually God delivered David from the danger, but here David admits that God's initial answer to his prayer was that God delivered him from all his fears. Not some of his fears, but all of his fears. So how do you overcome fear? Do you just decide to feel better? Do you just ignore your fears? Do you just forget about them? Do you fight against them? Listen, none of those strategies work, do they? If you've tried them, you know that none of that works. You don't just forget about a fear. You don't just kind of brush it aside. Someone once said, you push those fears out the front door and they run around the house and come in the back door or the basement window. You deal with fear by going to God, by seeking Him, by trusting Him to deliver you from them, by understanding that God alone is in control of all things. And look at what happens when you seek the Lord and you cast all of your cares upon Him. The Bible says what? Those who look to Him, those who seek Him, those who turn their face towards Him, they are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. The idea here is that those who look on God in the midst of their fear will not only be delivered from their fear, but they will also experience joy in place of fear. But in order to experience this, you need to be humble. David knew that there was nowhere else to turn and no one else could rescue him. He said, this poor man cried. This poor man. I have no one. I have nothing. I'm here in, in enemy territory, in really the grip of a king who would really like nothing more than to kill the one who has caused so much trouble for the Philistines. I've got nothing, I've got no one, this poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Remember something, David wrote this in a cave by himself while he was still on the run. So this can't mean that God saved him from a trouble-free life, but it does mean that God rescued him from what was troubling him. And I think David was talking about a soul rescue here. And this is important because it teaches us that God responds to the cry of the humble. It also teaches us that God protects those who are his and God delights in protecting us and so if you want to understand that the Lord is good you must praise the Lord you must seek the Lord and let me give you one more thing enjoy the Lord 
David says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Because sometimes I think we talk as though turning to the Lord is like the last resort. Well, I've tried everything else, and now I just go to the Lord. As if, you know, he's the only option when no other option works. But he is actually the best choice. He is actually, ought to be the first choice. Why? Because God delights in us delighting in him. And he provides for us. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. God delights in providing for his people. Seek the Lord. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. We think about this and we know that God does provide for his people, but one of the things that we need to understand and realize is the greatest provision that he has ever made happened when he gave his son Jesus Christ to die in our place for our sin so that we might have a relationship with the God who created us. You look at this and you say, how in the world do you taste the Lord? You have to know him. And knowing him leads to loving him, and loving him leads to praising him, and praising him leads to seeking him, and seeking him leads to trusting him, and trusting him leads to knowing that the Lord is good. And in times like these, man, we need to enjoy the Lord, don't we? We need to realize that he alone is our fulfillment, our satisfaction, our hope. We need to be walking, talking billboards to a watching world that we can enjoy life even when COVID-19 is spreading rapidly and chaos begins to rule the day. Why? Because we have no lack. That in God, we have all we need. We lack no good thing. Let me just say this right now. If you do not know this God that I'm talking about, if you have never come to a place where you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, this good God stands ready to receive you if you'll call out to him in faith. Salvation comes by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. There is no work that you can perform that would merit his grace and his salvation. Why? Because there is no work that you could perform that would supersede the work that Jesus did on the cross for you. Jesus died in your place for your sin so that you might have life. And if you want to experience the life that God has intended for you to experience, and I'm not talking about a a trouble-free life, I'm not talking about a perfect life, but I'm talking about life, everlasting life. Life that comes from a relationship with him that that will go on forever, that, that neutralizes and paralyzes fear of death and uncertainty because you are in the grip of a God who has promised to hold you forever. It comes by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And I'm telling you, there are people all around us who need what we have. There are people all around us who need to know that the Lord is good. They need to hear it from us. They need to to see it displayed in our lives, especially in this time. Who knows the opportunities that you and I will have to share why we are so confident and why we have joy and why we're not chaotic and paralyzed by fear. We can say, listen, I'm not paralyzed by fear. I'm not scared. I'm not, I'm not worried about it because the Lord is good. Let me tell you about him. All week there's been a song that's been going through my head. I was raised in church. Three years old. Started going to church and have been in a church nearly every Sunday of my life. That's not an exaggeration. I've been in a church nearly every Sunday of my life. There's been some that I've missed, but not very many. And not just on Sunday mornings. I, the way I was raised, we went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, visitation. Yeah, I mean, we were always at church. It was kind of what our lives were built around. Centered on Christ, built around being part of the body. And... Uh, 
there was a, a time in the life of the church where really not a lot of new music was being written for the church. Um, and so, and the new music that was being written wasn't great. I mean, we were talking in the office this week about how lousy 70s music really is. Um, <laughs> you're laughing because most of you agree with that statement. 70s music is terrible. And uh, some of the songs that came out in the 70s and 80s, even for churches and Christians, they, they weren't really good. I'm thankful that we're living in a generation now where there are great songs being written again for the church. And they're, they're, they're powerful songs, declaring solid theological truths. And so we kind of, as a, as a people, went through a time where there weren't a lot of songs being written for churches today, or at that time, but now we're, we're in a different era. And I'm thankful for that, and all of us should be thankful for that, that God didn't stop uh, leading people to write songs in the 1900s early 1900s, but there was a song that we sang in our church all the time growing up, and it's come back to my heart and my mind a lot during this week as we've been going through trying to navigate things, and the song is, in times like these, we need a savior, in times like these, you need an anchor, be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. What a truth. We have an anchor for the soul. And the Lord is good. We don't have to react like everybody is reacting. We don't have to feel like everybody is feeling. Our Lord is good. Here's my encouragement to you. Take Psalm 34 and make it the desire of your heart and the pledge of your life as we're walking through this time together. Praise the Lord. Seek the Lord. And by all means, enjoy the Lord. And you know what? We're going to get through this. And maybe, maybe you'll, either, you'll even lead others to know, trust, and love God along the way. And what a great outcome would that be? Let's pray.